Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our, our pre-concert uh, panel discussion. We haven't had any pre-concert talks or, or, or events for quite some time. Uh, I think our last one would have been, well, it was pre-COVID, actually. It would have been in, in, in March last year when we were uh, playing our, or when Ivan was conducting the Brahms concerts. So, so we weren't sure if anyone was going to turn up tonight. So how wonderful to see, to see, uh, you, to see you all here. So this is, and this is 90 minutes, of course, before the concert. So that's a bit of an ask as well, because in the past, we've started these about an hour before the concert. So listen, thank you, everyone, um, for coming. Um, my name is Robert Gibson. I'm, I'm a content manager and, and special projects curator here at the TSO, and I'm um, delighted to introduce my fellow panellists here. Ivan Ordland on my right, uh, the uh, chief conductor and artistic director of the TSO, and someone who has a deep familiarity um, with, the, uh, with the symphonies of, of, of Beethoven. And on my left, Left, Dr. Gavin Daly, uh, Senior Lecturer in European History at the University of Tasmania, and a man of, who has many areas of expertise, um, one of them the Napoleonic Wars. So as soon as we noted that, <laughs> it, was a, it, it was a hotline straight to Gavin, come and, come and appear on our, on our panel, because um, tonight's concert um, features Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 1, and it's, the f it's, it's then the, the first in a series of concerts that, we, that we'll be rolling out between now and the end of the year, um, devoted to the first eight symphonies of Beethoven. So uh, this month, in the month of August, we have symphonies one, two, two's tomorrow night. If you haven't got a ticket for um, tomorrow night, we'll get one before you go tonight. The box office is open. Uh, in two weeks' time, we have symphony number three, the Eroica. And at the end of the month, we have symphony number four and symphony number five. Um, so we get through one to five this month, and then Ivan is, uh, will be back in November for symphonies six, seven, and eight. Um, so between now and the end of the year, we'll be, uh, we'll be rolling through the first uh, eight symphonies by Beethoven, all of which were written uh, in Europe during the Napoleonic period. So uh, the, 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 the Napoleonic Wars, in a way, were sort of the, the, the background, the soundtrack, if you like, or at least the background music, um, to, to eight, um, eight of, of Beethoven's nine symphonies. Hence the point of this discussion, Beethoven and his time, and uh, with a bit of a sub-theme there to do with um, life in Napoleonic Europe. And I think what, what, I'd what I'd like to do in the first instance is to have uh, Gavin Daly here, if, if Gavin would just kindly set the scene for us and give us some insights into life in Europe at this time. In other words, um, what was going on in the, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Gavin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so in a sense, what we're talking about here in the late 18th and early 19th century with, with Europe is an epoch dominated by revolution and war that really pitted the old Europe, centuries of old Europe, against the forces of change. And many contemporaries in this period saw themselves as living in an epoch of world historical importance. And so much of this was dominated by the French Revolution of 1789 that overthrew, that saw the overthrow of the old Bourbon monarchy, the established church, the social orders, and ushered in a new age, a brave new world, built around not principles of hierarchy, birth, uh, tradition, but rather merit, uh, liberty, equality, the values of human rights, popular sovereignty, nations. This was the language of the French Revolution. But it also came with a darker side, political violence, the guillotine, the execution of the king. And so the French Revolution was a source of both fear and inspiration throughout the late 18th and into the, into the 19th century and the Napoleonic era. And one of the sources of fear around the French Revolution was that it was exported beyond France's borders. So its adherents saw this as a, as a universal message that we will liberate oppressed peoples throughout the rest of Europe, many of whom didn't feel they were particularly oppressed or needed liberating. Uh, and so this began a period of, of almost 23 years of constant warfare. Right from 1792, when the French Revolutionary Wars begin, all the way through to the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte, his final defeat at Waterloo in June of 1815. So 23 years of incessant warfare 
that was unprecedented in terms of its scale, that it involved all the great powers, that there were very, largely no region was left untouched in Europe during this period through war. And our best estimates are perhaps as many as five million people died during the Napoleonic Wars themselves. And one person above all was on everyone's lips in this period, whether you were cursing him or admiring him, and that person was Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, whose dramatic rise and fall really affected so much of Europe during this period. So his emergence as a victorious general in Italy in the late 1790s against the Austrians, and his coming to power by a coup in 1799, establishing himself as a child of the revolution, as a savior of France, a consolidator of the revolution, but then someone who four years later crowns himself emperor and embarks on wars of conquest. Um, and his fall is just as dramatic as his rise, going into Russia, the Russian winter decimating his army, uh, that bringing about a number of, of defeats, military defeats, and his final defeat at, uh, at Waterloo. So we're talking about an epoch of, of extraordinary political revolution, of social, uh, social change, of mass warfare, and also a period of cultural and emotional revolution. Mm -hmm. That this is an age of, that's coming out of what's called the age of sensibility and sentimentalism in the late 18th century, and this fed into the Romantic era which is very much a, a repudiation of the Enlightenment and the age of reason, a repudiation of courtly society with its very stiff formalism. Uh, the, the Romantics was a call to the emotions, a call to the heart. Mm. Uh, this was an age of feelings that encouraged people to smile and encouraged people to weep. And there was certainly a lot of weeping uh, during the Napoleonic during the Napoleonic Wars. And, and, and musically, I mean, Beethoven was there at, right at the, you know, at, there at the right time. I mean, there's only one year separating Beethoven and Napoleon, that, that Napoleon was one year older. Um, but yeah, Beethoven, in so many respects, was the, you know, was the composer of, of the period. And mm -hmm. so many things you've mentioned there already, there are connection points with uh, Beethoven's music or just you know, um, music key musical works in general. Yes. Um, I mean, a much later one, of course, is, is if I may mention Tchaikovsky, the 1812 Overture, which yes. is, you know, written much later in the 19th century, but in a way, you know, it's, it's, commemorating, it's commemorating the defeat of, of Napoleon's um, armies uh, in, in Russia. Oh, but if, we, if we can turn to you, and, and we'll, you know, we'll get onto this discussion of Beethoven as a musical revolutionary. Before we do that, though, if you could just outline for us, you know, the, the, your journey it's in Beethoven's music throughout your life, because you've been conducting orchestras for a number of years, but in a, in a, but in a former life, you were a violinist uh, and yes. indeed a concertmaster. Yes. So you, you, you must know these works then from, from inside the orchestra, as well as standing in front of the orchestra. So if you could just tell us a little bit about your personal journey or connection with Beethoven's symphonies over the years. Um, yes, I got my first job as a concertmaster of the Philharmonic Orchestra in my hometown, Bergen. And um, I was, yeah, 24 and had played, you know, a few of the Beethoven symphonies about three years into my time in Bergen. We played the whole uh, cycle in a very short time, all the, all the nine symphonies. And it was such, it really left such a strong impression on me. It, from then on, I've been working, you know, I call them old friends, these symphonies. But they're, they're friends, but they're works that you have to fight with. And study, re-study, and perform, go back and study again. I think it has something to do with Beethoven, was not like Mozart at all. He, Mozart could sit down and write out a perfect composition. It's as if God was holding his hand. Beethoven struggled. The, the first sketches for the first symphony um, we find in sketchbooks five years before the premiere. So he was working hard and I don't know, it's, it's a privilege to work on these and to spend a whole life working on these works. Uh, it's a big challenge for any conductor, for any orchestra. Um, but 
This aspect of doing them all together, this is the journey that you're, we are invited you, in, inviting you to take part in. Because they are so strong individually, but the sum of these works is enormous. When you say fight with them, what's, what's the battle going on there? That you've had to fight with these pieces? What's, what's, what's the... Where, where, where does the conflict lie? Mm. I find it hard to say exactly why. Yeah. I, this was also back when I was a violinist. Mm. I played a recital with three Beethoven sonatas. And we did a, a tour with the same program. Normally that becomes easier the second night, third night, fourth, then it becomes easy. With Beethoven it's not like that. It's, it becomes more and more difficult. <laughs> um, but we've had good rehearsals, and uh, we're really looking forward to playing the program to, today and tomorrow. One of the, um, I mean, one of the, one of the symphonies that has a very strong connection with with with, with Napoleon Bonaparte is the uh, is the Eroica Symphony, which is going to be performed in in, in two weeks' time, so a fortnight from from tonight. Um, Gavin, if could you just sort of. Uh, give us some little uh, pointers as to because this, this was a this, this was a key symphony for um, Beethoven's relationship with 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 Napoleon. Mm. If you could just sort of indicate what what how how did, how did Napoleon upgrade his job title um, <laughs> in the you know in the first in the in the first five years of of of, of the nineteenth century? So he was he, he so you mentioned general. Um, yes. We go from there to... So he's, he's, he's a general, and then uh, once he takes power in, uh, in late 1799, he becomes the first consul of, of France. So right. you can see the Roman influence there. There were three consuls. He was the most, uh, the most powerful of the consuls. So he's first consul in 1800. Then he upgrades that in 1802 to uh, uh, first consul for life. Um, <laughs> Uh, so you can see this sort of growing concentration of power. This is, France is still a republic at mm. this point in time. So general, consul, first consul for life, and then 1804, well, why not make myself an emperor? Um, not a king, yeah. an emperor. Yeah. Uh, so in, in May, of 18, May of 1804, um, he decides that France will become an empire, and that ends the uh, period of republican history in, in France. Uh, at that point in time, and it also changes him from Bonaparte to Napoleon. Uh -huh. um, and there's a famous line where someone in a dictionary put, Bonaparte died on such a day, and then you go to Napoleon for another entry. <laughs> so uh, so th this dismayed a lot of Republicans who were still saw a lot of positive things in Napoleon, despite some reservations, but then, yes, crowns himself emperor in um, December of 1804. See, and that's fascinating because because first consul for life is 1802, yeah. and the following year, 1803, is when Beethoven writes the Eroica Symphony, mm. which was originally titled Bonaparte. Mm. Okay, that's not using the word Napoleon; it was yeah. Bonaparte. Yeah. That's that, that's 1803, um, and then uh, that symphony was first performed in 1805. In the interim, Napoleon has crowned himself emperor, and so Beethoven has scratched out. Um, scratched out the word Bonaparte in the title page, um, so much so that you know it's, it's, the, pen, the pen's gone through, you know, has gone through the has gone through <laughs> yes. the, the, the paper or the parchment, um, you know, and 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 you know he's scratched out this name um, uh, Bonaparte, and that's what's happened in the interim. Mm. Um, I mean, this is a very revolutionary work, the the, the the Eroica Symphony. Can you talk to that a bit, Ivan, about why you know, what the revolutionary aspects of the symphony, yeah. which was you know, which Beethoven made very clear, was originally titled. Bonaparte. He was the yes. subject, if you like, if you like, of this symphony. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Beethoven is such a radical composer. If I can go back a little bit before that, of to, course, to the first symphony, yes. leading up to Eroica, um, Beethoven had studied with Haydn. He moved to Vienna in uh, 1792. He had been there three years earlier. Heard, uh, probably heard Mozart in concert. So he comes out of, of Vienna, 1790s. And Haydn asked, because he saw that Beethoven, his student, was an extremely gifted young man. So he said to, to Beethoven, please can you write on top of your compositions by Ludwig van Beethoven, pupil of Joseph Haydn. <laughs> and the uh, reason I say this is, 
Beethoven, Beethoven never did that. He, was, he didn't want to be anybody's student. And already in the first symphony, we see how radical he is. Just with the opening, people were totally confused by the, this opening that we are used to hearing today. It's a piece in C major, and he starts with a C seventh chord. I will not get too technical. But he starts with a chord that leads us away from the main key of the piece. He's studying in F. What? I mean, it's, it's, it's the dominant seventh of F. So we're kind of, we're, yes, we're we go to piece. F. Hmm. Then we go from G. You think maybe C major now. No, A minor. Two bars, only two bars. And he shocks hmm. the musical world of hmm. this time. Hmm. Um, there are many new aspects. but. I, the point is, this was premiered in 1800, yes. exactly, is that he was a radical from the beginning. And when we get to the Eroica, the ideas are just so big. He writes Eroica to Bonaparte, Bonaparte. Mm -hmm. and it's twice as long as anything that had been written at that time. Mozart, Haydn, twice as long. Huge uh, funeral march as the central movement, new, unusual. With, uh, with, with, with military overtones. Yes. I mean, you, you know, you said it's a period of continuous war. Mm. Yeah. And, we, you know, and, and here we have, you know, it's a military march, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a mili military march. Funeral march. Mm. Funeral march, but played to be played sotto voce. Mm quietly mm. whispering. Mm. So it's not a, this kind of, no. of march. It's mm. so quiet, it's sad. And, and it's a wonderful, it's, it's really like an earthquake in, in classical music history. Mm. Um, I don't know if this is authentic Haydn quote, but, but anyway, he is supposed to have said that with the Eroica, Beethoven does something new. He places him, himself in the center of his music. He um, writes music to bear his soul. And, um, and Haydn said, this is new. I don't, know, and this is back to what you were saying about the romantic, the idea of the romantic, that the composer is the hero in a way. It's about him expressing himself, not writing for a social occasion somewhere. Mm, yeah, um, and I think what's, what, what is key there also, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's like what you were saying, um, Gavin, about you know, um, subjectivity um, and expressivity and, mm. and uh, human emotion. And yes. I mean, Beethoven was fully aware of the of the spirit of the times, that this was a new era, yes. and, and, you know, and this new era demands this 45-minute yeah. symphony. But it was also written you know, two years, or one year, rather, after the, after the um, Beethoven summer at the outside Vienna, at, at the little town of um, Heiligenstadt, yes. which was a, uh, you know, a period in Beethoven's life when, when he, he recognised that his deafness was incurable um, and that he somehow had to face up to a life as a musician, as, as, a, deaf, as a deaf musician. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, Beethoven commits to paper a document which we know of now as the Heiligenstadt Testament, um, which was a letter that he didn't intend to be made public, uh, a letter written to, written to his brothers, where he explains his feelings upon, upon realising that, um, you know, this, 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 this catastrophic um, uh, malady that, um, that, that, that uh, afflicts him. And, and I'll, I'll just read you one tiny sentence from that. And, and, and Beethoven talks about, he says that he, he contemplated suicide at this point mm -hmm. um, because he realised that, that, that his life wasn't going to take the path that he thought it would. Mm -hmm. um, and he realised it was going to be a, a, a life that might be very much a life alone, um, a, a life in social isolation. Uh, a life uh, where he might have uh, difficulty forming intimate relationships with people and a life that will, uh, it is catastrophic for his musical career. Uh, he contemplated taking his own life and he, says, um, and he says, it was only my art that held me back. It seemed impossible to leave the world until I had brought forth all that I felt was within me. 
And that's, that, I, mean, that, yes. I mean, that's an impossible statement from someone like Haydn or Mozart, yes. you know, that, that I, needed to, I needed to remain in this world because I need to bring from within me the art that remains within me to bring to the people and to, and to, and to, and to history, to later generations. I mean, that idea of, that idea of, of, of Beethoven as a romantic archetype yeah. is very, very powerful. But, but, but it also ties in with Napoleon. I mean, I mean, Napoleon is also a romantic archetype, isn't he? In what, it, in what sense? In many ways, he is the poster boy of romanticism in this, mm. in this era. So if you look at other great romantic figures across the arts, whether it be Beethoven, uh, Byron, uh, Goethe, they're all looking at Napoleon and sort of measuring themselves against Napoleon as a romantic figure. Sometimes they're competitive, sometimes they self-identify, sometimes they want to uh, be, uh, be a Napoleonic figure. Uh, Byron even goes to the extreme of having a, a, a replica made of Napoleon's carriage that he then uh, ponces about Europe after, after Waterloo. And that carriage act, incidentally, ends up in South Australia. So. Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, which is an interesting story in itself. But yes, so Napoleon, Napoleon is, appeals to romantics because he's, he's self-made that he's, he's, he, he comes from relatively humble beginnings. Without the revolution, there is no Napoleon. See, and, 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 and this is what Beethoven admired in Napoleon, mm. because Beethoven saw himself as self-made. Uh, and this idea of, of uh, you know, you are, you are not, you know, you're not born into that position, you're not an aristocrat. Um, you know, the self-made man was extremely important for, for Beethoven as well. Yeah, yeah, and so force of will. Mm. Uh, and in this sense, the, the idea of the genius rising, mm -hmm. rising up. Um, but Napoleon also appeals because he's a man of action. Mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, when Hegel sees Napoleon in Jena, he calls him famously uh, the world spirit on horseback. Mm -hmm. That Napoleon's a man of action and he's a breaker of rules. Um, he, he doesn't play by the rule book. He, he literally destroys kingdoms. Mm -hmm. uh, he does not, uh, he, he uh, subverts authority, mm -hmm. subverts the establishment. Mm -hmm. And he's a very dangerous figure in that, mm. in that sense. So he's a very radical figure, even after he crowns himself emperor. Uh, this causes anxiety amongst established emperors and kings throughout Europe. Not that he's just overthrowing us, but that he, he can just turn himself into one of us. Yes, yes. What does this say about us and our mm. and established divine, tradition, our own claim divine, to legitimacy? Divine right. He's just, mm. yeah, he's just... To mm. crown, and he crowns himself. He literally mm. crowns That's right. himself. That's right. Mm. Um, the Pope doesn't crown him. He crowns mm. himself. Mm. So mm. The, all those things appeal to romantic sensibilities. Yeah. I mean, in so many respects, we could be talking about Beethoven there um, with all yeah. those comments that, 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 <laughs> yeah. that Gavin's applied to Napoleon. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, uh, mainly because it seems to me, Ivan, that there's this very powerful... If we're, if we're talking about tumult and revolution and whatever, there seems to be this very powerful... Um, struggle to victory yeah. trajectory yeah. that runs through um, Beethoven's fifth. Yeah. Can you talk about the fifth? Can you... This uh, was such an important work. It, it became a model for many uh, composers later on. Tchaikovsky's fourth is modelled exactly on, on Beethoven's fifth symphony. It's one of these works that has reached so far outside of the world of uh, music lovers, everybody knows the pa-pa-pa-pa, <laughs> this beginning. It's a ringtone. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 yes, it's ringtone. So it's like the Mona Lisa or the Scream by Edvard Munch. It, it reaches. So there is so much dynamite in these four notes, which is actually two notes. ta 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 pa. that's yeah. the second note. Um, and from this concentrated fight, minor movement, uh, it ends in, C, it starts C minor, ends in C major. Also unusual at this mm. time. Um, but it's like a blaze of C major. It's like, it's like the, you know, this, this march, this victory march into it, C minor has been conquered, C major is the victor. It is so, and it ends with, I don't know how many bars of C major chords. I, I will go and count. A lot. Um, yeah. a, lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot. Mm. Um, mm. So it's, it's, it's popular, very, very popular for a reason. Yeah. I mean, it's so, so strong. And as I said, its influence was so big. But it also, the last movement 
quotes a revolu French revolutionary yes. song. Yes. As, as, but, as quite a lot of Beethoven's music did at this time. Yeah, mm. yeah. You know, Cherubini and people like that. I mean, even, yeah. e, even E.T.A. Hoffman, writing in, in, in 1810, that he was able to identify, again, we're talking about you know, the, the newness of the period. They all understood mm. the new epoch. And he says, and he's talking about Beethoven's fifth, and this is E.T.A. Hoffman, he says, Beethoven's music sets in motion the machinery of awe, of fear, of terror, of pain, and awakens that infinite yearning which is the essence of romanticism. It is such a great sentence there because mm. you know, this, this sense of the infinite, that, that which, which you can't possibly fathom, but you could only try to understand, yeah. that you can try to grasp, but it's always out of reach. But it's, mm. it's you know, the, the, you know it's the machinery of awe, fear, terror, and pain. Yeah. It's the sublime. The sublime, of, the course, sublime. of course, yeah. yeah. Mm. But when you look at the, these uh, symphonies together, the fifth symphony was premiered at the same concert as the sixth mm. symphony, plus many other works, and it ended with a choral fantasy. It was a four-hour mm. concert. As usual, yeah. Mm. <laughs> but Beethoven's fourth, no, I'm sorry, fifth and sixth could not be more different. This drama going through the fifth uh, to the major, and then comes the wide landscape of the sixth, the pastoral symphony, uh, where he tries to paint the picture of human feelings when we are in nature. So they are so different, and this is Beethoven, where he's also different from Be Haydn, Mozart. Because every work has to be different. He makes a new model yes. nearly for every, yes, every for work. every work. Yes, every uh, one of a kind. You know, the unique the unique artwork. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, he, he writes the first eight symphonies within, I think, 14 years mm. from sketches. And, mm. and then he waits 12 years before the ninth is written. And that is, of course, another revolution who had used choir and four soloists mm. in a symphony. Mm. Again, mm. this creating a new model for mm. ev every work. Mm. Yeah. And maybe also tying back to the revolution theme and the ideas. It's so beautiful in the ninth when alle Menschen werden Brüder. Yeah. So all men shall be as brothers, yeah. something like that yeah, in yeah. English. Yeah. Yeah. And this that, yes, that we are together, we are the same. And, but, you know, and a complete, but a completely unprecedented work. You know, Absolutely. This, this, this four movement symphony with this massive um, choral finale. Um, Gavin, I'm keen to get a sense of what, what life was like in occupied parts of Europe. So Vienna, which, which became uh, Beethoven's hometown. Well, his hometown was Bonn, but he moved to Vienna mm -hmm. um, at the age of 22, and he remained there for the rest of his life. Now, he lived through... He lived through French occupation twice. Mm. What was what was it like? I mean, we, we know that we know, for instance, that in one of I, th I think it was the 1809 occupation. You know, he talks about uh, hiding in the cellar mm. and with pillows around his ears because the bombardments were so powerful. Mm. Um, what was it like for, for people living under occupation? So that varied across Europe, and so in parts of Europe where you had incredibly savage conflicts like the Peninsula War in Spain and in Russia, occupation could be catastrophic. In Vienna, relatively speaking, it's a mild occupation, but for the, the inhabitants, this is, this is a catastrophe. And just to put it into context, when Napoleon's forces enter Vienna in 1805, this is the first time a foreign army had occupied Vienna in 320 years. Yeah. Because they, the, the, the Turks were kept at bay. 320 years. The, mm. the last army there was the Hungarians in 1485. Mm. So it's 320 years. This is the, the heartland of the Habsburg Empire, the most mm. prestigious empire in Europe. And here is Napoleon with his French army mm. in, in Vienna. What normally happened with the, when an army was approaching, and this happened in Vienna, was the emperor and all the elites left. Uh, so most of them <laughs> flee to their country estates. It's often the poor that bear the yes. that bore the brand. Yes. Uh, so it's a relatively mild occupation in 1805. In 1809, the 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 Austrians tried to defend Vienna, and the French bombard Vienna. It's not a it's not a, a long bombardment, but it's a bombardment that lasts several days with howitzers, and that was terif That was a terrifying experience. Mm. Bombardment. Mm. Uh, this was war directly going to cities 
and Beethoven was terrified by that experience, and many who were in Vienna were at that at that time. I mean, Haydn actually died at that time. I mean, Haydn, mm. Haydn died during the 1809 occupation. Um, before he died, though, um, uh, a, a French soldier came to his house and sang to Haydn for a tenor, and he sang an aria from the Creation. And Haydn said it was so beautiful. Um, it, was, it was just sung so beautifully by, this, by, by a, a French soldier. Mm. And I just want to, but I do want to read a, a, um, an, an account here um, from a, a music-loving French diplomat. This is from 1809, um, a chap by the name of uh, uh, Baron de Tremont, and, uh, and he, he visited Beethoven in, in 1809, uh, and he, he, he wrote an account of, of that visit. And, and what's wonderful about this is, is, is that he, 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 he walks into Beethoven's home space, which is his workspace, and, and he writes up what he, what he saw. And he says, Picture to yourself the dirtiest, most disorderly place imaginable. He was a huge fan of Beethoven's, by the way, so he was quite taken aback by this interior. So picture yourself the dirtiest, most disorderly place imaginable. Blotches of moisture covered the ceiling, an oldish, an oldish grand piano on which the dust disputed the place with various pieces of engraved and manuscript music. Under the piano, I do not exaggerate, and this, these are his words, I do not exaggerate, an unemptied chamber pot, Beside it, a small walnut table accustomed to the frequent overturning of the secretary placed upon it, a quantity of pens encrusted in ink, then more music. The chairs, mostly cane-seated, were covered with plates bearing the remains of last night's supper and with wearing apparel. It's just such a wonderful account that there's, there's, there's food on plates um, gathered around the room. There are clothes thrown over things. There's an unemptied chamber pot. There's a very, very dusty space. And it was from a, from a French diplomat. Now, at that same time, in 1809, um, Beethoven was offered a position in Kassel, the German city of Kassel, which was the capital of, um, of Westphalia. Mm. Now... And this, there, was a, there was a Bonaparte there. There, was, there were many Bonapartes everywhere. So did Napoleon yeah. just sort of drop his relations around he the various courts of Europe? He did indeed. He just spread his siblings over the thrones of, thrones of Europe. So um, little Jerome was given uh, Westphalia. Joseph right. was given Spain. Right. Um, uh, his sisters, Caroline, uh, got uh, Naples. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They were they were just they were just handed they were just handed out. And so, yeah. and, and Beethoven used this as leverage to stay in Vienna mm. because he 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 made it known that he, he you know that he, that he might move to Kassel because he has this opportunity to to take the position of Kapellmeister at the court of Jerome Bonaparte. Yeah. yeah? Uh, and this is when Beethoven uh, um, made it clear that he might go. And so a, so a consortium of aristocrats in in Vienna of noblemen. Uh, pooled their money and, and guaranteed um, Beethoven a, a stipend for life on the condition that he remain in Vienna. So Beethoven was quite shrewd in that he used, he used the Napoleonic connections there yeah, to actually yeah. cement, his, to cement his place in, in, in Vienna. Um, another symphony with Napoleonic connections is the symphony number no. 7, um, and this was, this, this, this was premiered in, in Vienna in, uh, in, in December 1813. Um, and this was at a, at a concert to raise funds for Austrian and Bavarian soldiers. That so was a benefit concert for soldiers who had been injured um, fighting in, in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and um, Ivan, this is one of your favourite symphonies, I believe, yeah? Um, it is wonderful, yeah. and it is one the only symphony. This is the seventh. I, the seventh, where I feel rhythm is the key element through the whole symphony, and uh, Wagner called it the apotheosis of dance. Mm. So it's a dancing, energetic symphony like nothing else. Mm. Even the slow movement has uh, not. It has a beautiful melody on top, but it has. Din, bom. A rhythmic um, bass that carries through yes. through that movement. Yes. Yeah. It's a wonderful work. It's one of the first I remember to have played. I played this in Bergen with um, when I had my job with 
the father of Maris Janssons conducting, Arvid Janssons, who was a great conductor, and I still remember just that version. Yeah. And there's no real slow movement in that symphony. I mean, you know, it's, a, no, it's the, the it's second movement. rhythm as well. Mm, yeah, yeah. From, start, from start to finish. Yeah. Now, a, um, a, a work that was paired with that, um, uh, at, that at the premiere in December 1813 and was played with the seventh in many concerts throughout 1814, and these are all benefit concerts mm. for Austrian and Bavarian soldiers, um, was uh, a piece by the name of uh, Wellington's Victory, I'd just be curious to know by a show of hands, has anyone in the audience here heard live Beethoven's work, Wellington's Victory? Because it's a, it's, it's a symphonic work that comes between the seventh and eighth symphonies. Oh, we have one hand here. Yeah, right up. Wow, okay, because it's, 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 very, very, it's very, very rarely performed, um, Wellington's, Wellington's um, Victory. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it, it, you can tell from the title, uh, it's inspired by... Um, the Battle of Vittoria mm. in, in Spain. So what, what, what happened there? Tell us about the, the Battle of Vittoria. So the okay. Battle of Vittoria, the Peninsular War in Spain had been raging since 1808, the British playing a key role in that, and the Battle of Vittoria is really the, the last great battle and the decisive battle that there's no turning back for the French thereafter. So yeah. uh, uh, Joseph Bonaparte and, and the French are defeated at Vittoria, in, in northern Spain. Mm. And it really highlights in 1814 and 1815 that Wellington is such, a, is such a major figure on the international stage at that, at that stage, mm. at that time, and we often forget, forget that. If, we, if you wander into Apsley House, which is Wellington's um, townhouse in London, where there's a wonderful art collection that he got from the Spanish Royal Collection, you just hi it highlights just how much gratitude there was in, in Europe at this time, particularly after Waterloo, but even, even before then. Well, these, these audiences in Vienna went nuts for Wellington's victory. It was, oh, it was, it, it was by far <laughs> Beethoven's most popular symphonic, symphonic work, and, and it, it includes... Um, it includes uh, there's, there's sort of, it's like a potpourri in one sense. We hear Rural Britannia, we hear <laughs> For He's a Jolly Good Fellow, um, we hear God Save the King or God Save the Queen, um, and I mean, it, it, it really is a, you know, it's a piece of music where, where Beethoven casts aside sort of his, his, his elevated, you know, his, his, you know, his elevated musical ideals, if you like, and plays to the gallery and throws these, these, these jolly tunes in. And it was, it was a, it, it, you know, it, it more or less is a musical rendition. It's about 20 minutes long of, of that battle, of the mm. two, of, you know, of the, of the various armies meeting. And then, of course, as the title indicates, um, it's, you know, won by, won by um, uh, Wellington. Ivan, you might have to leave us at this point to prep for the concert. We're, go we're, we're going to talk for a little bit longer, but, but, but we're going to give Ivan an early mark because he's got to get his head together for um, <laughs> yeah. tonight's concert. If we could just thank oh, Ivan yeah. for taking part. Thank toy, you. toy, toy. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you. Thank you. Because for our last five minutes or so, um, Gavin, I'd be keen to get a sense of, of Europe after Napoleon. So we have... Mm. And because, again, Vienna's a focal point. We've actually got, you know, in, in 1814, 15, we've got the, the Congress of Vienna. It's the gathering of all the crowned heads of, of, of Europe and probably countless hangers-on as well. Many men. They've yeah. all gathered. And Beethoven's there at the centre of all of that. This was his most, sex, most successful year ever, 1814, 1815. But what was... I mean, Beethoven still has another, uh, what, 12 years to live. What was the political climate like in Austria after the Congress of Vienna. So we're now talking about the age of, what, Clemens von Metternich. Yes, and so the Congress of Vienna really tries to put the genie back into the bottle uh, in terms of revolution and nationalism, to try and turn the clock back, if you like, to pre-1789. And Metternich is part of that reaction, uh, trying to curb the forces that have been unleashed from the French Revolution. So I was trying to contain France, but also to, to contain those powerful forces of liberalism, of radicalism and nationalism throughout the rest of, the rest of Europe. And so Metternich is at the forefront of that. Mm. Uh, so you've got the reimposition of censorship in Austria and, the German and, and parts of Germany and in northern Italy, which were restored to Italy after the after the, um, during and after the Congress. So it's a period of renewed censorship, of police surveillance, of spy networks yeah. that are trying to suppress. And it's the crowned heads 
saying, you know, we're back and we're running the show. That's right. So yep. we had what, um, Britain, Austria, Prussia. And Russia. Russia. And it's Russia in particular mm. that everyone's got their eye on, mm -hmm. particularly the Austrians. They are increasingly alarmed with, mm. with Russian power, mm. Russian Cossacks in mm. cafes in Paris. Mm. Uh, in this in this period, yeah. um, so it's trying to juggle juggle a lot, a lot, but it's the crowned heads trying to restore Europe as it had been before 1789. But mm. there was no going, there was mm. no going back. Mm. And what and what's fascinating there, I think, in terms of Beethoven, is you know, as as Ivan said, we get that one we get that one more symphony, the ninth, mm. which is this great you know this setting of Schiller's Ode to Joy. But in a sense, it's it's. It's not a joyous country, you know. It's it's almost a police state, yeah. I mean, yes. With, with, with yeah. censorship and 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 just police surveillance. Very much so. Mm. Um. Um, I think just in wrapping it up, it's sort of it's it's it, you know, I'd like all of us to be mindful of the ways in which here in Hobart, you know, the Napoleonic Wars are. Uh, inscribed into our surroundings. We've been, we've been referring to the name, you know, Wellington, of course, which is which is Mount Wellington Kunanyi here. Um, Gavin, what's? I mean, I mean you know, we, we we all refer to Salamanca or Salamanca Place, but there's a Napoleonic mm. connection there. Absolutely. That prior to Vittoria, that was Wellington's most famous victory, the Battle of Salamanca, in eighteen in eighteen twelve. Uh, we have... Uh, yeah, we've got Napoleon Street. We've got Bat Napoleon Street in, mm. in, uh, Battery in, Battery, in Battery Point. We have uh, Albuera or Albura, which is named after a, 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 a very bloody battle and in you've Spain. lost... Where, where's that? In uh, the, the, the high school or... Yes, it's the, a Sorry, the, the primary school. Where in, is it? In, um, in, in Sandy Bay. OK, so sorry, in, what's yeah. it named after? A, a battle in, in Spain in 1811. Wow. Mm. Yeah, I think it's just. I think it's yeah. well. I think it's well for us to remember that you know that the early, you know, white history of, of, of Hobart is saturated in some ways with the uh, with 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 the names of, of, of people and places, people and places from the Napoleonic the Napoleonic period. Mm. Mm. Um, folks, we're going to have to wind up there. Um, thank you so much for coming along. Thank you to uh, Dr. Gavin Daly. Um, and uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to empty the hall at this stage because we have to reset the stage and for safety reasons we need to, we need to empty the hall. But thank you so much for coming along. I hope you enjoy tonight's concert. Tomorrow night we have um, Beethoven Symphony number two. Uh, in two weeks' time, the Eroica that's being performed on, on, on uh, Friday and a Saturday night, an absolutely key work in any connections between Beethoven and Napoleon. And then Symphonies four and five uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the month. But thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoy the concert. Thank you. Thanks, Gavin. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> right.